Now we're going to be reintroduced to a prominent DC writer named Gardner Fox. There he is on the left in a, uh, a drawing by, by Gil Kane, whom we're about to meet in a moment. That's probably Gardner Fox in the 1960s. And then on the right, there's a, uh, an image of him in the 1980s later in life. Now, Gardner Fox, the name might be familiar to you from uh, way back in uh, uh, lecture number 10 when we talked about, uh, uh, there's, there's young Gardner Fox there, talked about the fact that uh, in 1939, 1940, Gardner Fox co-created The Sandman, The Flash, Hawkman, and Dr. Fate. And then in 1941, uh, working with editor Sheldon Meyer, he took those four individuals and teamed them up with the Atom, the Spectre, Green Lantern, and Our Man to form the Justice Society of America, which uh, ran in All-Star Comics until 1951. 1951 is when the Justice Society went under as uh, kind of the straggling remnants of the once popular superhero genre. Well, in the mid 1950s, in 1954, uh, Fox, still working at DC, mostly writing uh, westerns and uh, beginning to write science fiction stories, working, uh, working with Julius Schwartz. In fact, Gardner Fox was the scripter for the adventures of Adam Strange in which uh, Schwartz was the co-plotter. So the editor, Schwartz, and the writer, Fox, would get together, figure out what the plot's going to be. Fox would write it out, and the artists would, uh, would draw it. Well, that's where he was in 1954. He had also been writing uh, short stories for the pulp magazines. He would write uh, several science fiction novels. And altogether, over the course of his career, it's estimated that he wrote about 4,000 comic book stories, roughly 1,500 of them, for DC. Well, here's Gil Kane that we just mentioned, um, who was uh, born to a Jewish family in Latvia, who emigrated to Brooklyn when he was three years old. He was born Eli Katz. Gil Kane would be closely associated with Silver Age DC, uh, particularly with uh, the character The Atom. He would also do a lot of sword and sorcery type stuff for various different companies. He had a very distinctive Now let's talk angular about Carmine style. Infantino, an Italian-American New Yorker who got into the comics business in the late 1940s on the tail end of the Golden Age. And some of his early work during the Golden uh, Age included work on The Flash. He's best known, artistically probably, for his, his long tenure as artist on the Silver Age Flash, for, uh, which lasted for about 10 years. His style is kind of, uh, kind of reminiscent in some ways of Dick Sprang. His, uh, his characters have... Uh, lantern jaws and uh, are kind of kind of blocky but uh, Infantino um, goes beyond just uh, his his work as an artist well 1964 Infantino uh, and editor Julius Schwartz who by that time was in charge of all the Batman and Superman titles were approached by Erwin Donenfeld, remember he was the uh, son of Harry Donenfeld and became editorial director by the 60s. He was the executive vice president of DC Comics. Um, he was approached by Donenfeld, he and uh, Schwartz, and told that you know the, the sales on Batman were going down and something had to be done quickly. That There had to be some kind of uh, uh, revamping. And uh, it was Infantino, actually, who, who took over at that point from Sprang and who introduced that yellow, uh, yellow uh, thing behind the, uh, 
the the bat on Batman's chest. Anyway, 1966, he was approached once again by the boss, Donenfeld, although Jack Leibowitz was the real boss. And, um, well, no, I'm getting ahead of myself. He was actually uh, approached by Stan Lee. After having been approached by Donenfeld and, and being made the offer or the assignment of doing all the DC covers. So uh, that's when he left The Flash because now he's doing like all the covers. That's a, that's a lot. And Stan Lee then approached him over at Marvel and offered him $22,000 a year to leave DC completely and come over to Marvel which was uh, quite a temptation because that's significantly more than he was making. So he told his bosses at DC about the offer he had received, and Jack Leibowitz informed him, uh, informed him, uh, yeah, we can't afford that. We can't afford to give you $22,000 a year. But what we can do is if you stay, we will give you a promotion to uh, art director for all of DC. So he, he viewed that as, even though it was a little less money, more of a challenge than just doing all covers all the time. So he took that, uh, and he became the art director in 1966. Then, 1967, the uh, company changed hands. DC was, was sold. Leibowitz stayed on, but Erwin Donenfeld, whose father had passed away a couple of years earlier, was squeezed out of the company completely. And Carmine Infantino was made editorial director. So essentially, he's running the day-to-day -day operations of DC Comics from that point forward for uh, almost a decade. Uh, then in the late 70s, and we'll talk about this later on, he gets squeezed out and replaced. And when that happens, he goes back to being a freelancer and actually goes back to uh, doing The Flash and also starts doing some work for Marvel. He did uh, most, of, uh, most of the issues in the late 70s of the new Marvel character, Spider-Woman. But here's what I remember him for as a child of the 70s. And that is that, uh, I think around issue 11 or so, um, he took over the art chores for the comic book Star Wars. Uh, and uh, would do that through the late 70s and, and early 80s. So uh, my association with Star Wars outside the, the movie, movie house, uh, from those years, the characters look like they were drawn by Carmine in Fantano. And this is Joe Kubert, born to a Jewish family in Poland who emigrated when he was very young to New York City. He got, uh, he got on at a young age uh, with uh, all American comics during the Golden Age. He worked on Hawkman, uh, during those years, and he also did several uh, issues of, uh, of, of All-Star with the uh, Justice Society of America. His style was reminiscent in some way similar to Gil Kane in that it was very angular, and it's kind of reminiscent of uh, John Severin in that it has kind of a grainy, rough quality to it, making it very distinctive. Uh, Kubert would uh, play a large role in some of the things we're going to be talking about uh, yet to come. But in addition to that, in 1976, he established the Joe Kubert School of Cartoon and Graphic Art, which is still going strong. And his two sons, uh, Andy and Adam Kubert, would also become titans in the comic book industry as, as artists later on. Now let's look at a writer, Robert Conniger, who was uh, the son of Jewish-Romanian immigrants who came to New York City. Here's 
Conagher as a young man in the 1940s, and there on the right, you can see him as a much older guy. And, and here he is breaking the fourth wall in one of his comic books that he wrote. So he got started uh, early in the Golden Age also at All-American Comics, where he wrote various different things, including uh, some occasional tales of the Justice Society of America. In 1948, he took over as writer for Wonder Woman after the death of Wonder Woman's creator, William Moulton Marston, uh, alias Charles Moulton. And he would be the uh, Wonder Woman scripter for about the next 20 years. So uh, all through that period uh, there when uh, Ross Andrew and Mike Esposito had taken over from H.G. Peter, uh, Conagher was writing Wonder Woman's stories. Also, uh, during the Golden Age, it, particularly, he, he wrote a lot of Hawkman uh, stories. Hawkman didn't have his own title, but he, had, he was a backup in several other books. And uh, Conagher worked with Gil Kane on those Hawkman stories in the 1940s. And by the 1950s, was working often again with Gil Kane in the, uh, uh, well, our army at war there at D.C. But uh, actually, uh, Conagher was writing all the D.C. war books, all six of them, for, for quite a while there in the early to mid-1950s. All right. Well, that's a lot of names. That's a lot of people. And that's a lot of dates. But now we're reaching the point where all the stuff that we've just talked about for the last probably hour and a half, really, are all going to come together in a fascinating way. So prepare yourself, brace yourself. Here we go. All right, well, clearly those Senate subcommittee hearings about comic books in 1954 had a huge impact on the industry. They had a huge impact on just about everybody, really, except for Harvey Comics and Dell, um, because uh, they were doing well. Harvey had all funny animal, and Dell had a lot of funny animal plus some licensed properties. They were affected in that their sales went up because the sales of their competitors immediately started going down. And again, TV was part of that. Uh, DC. Although they had dabbled in the crime and horror genres, uh, dabbling really is a better description of it than plunging headfirst like EC did. Uh, none of the DC titles that even touched on those topics had the, um, had the sort of um, graphic, extreme violence nor highly sexually suggestive stuff that EC and many of its imitators had. So, so DC's all doing all right in that regard. Once, uh, you know, so many people, um, many of whom were already forming opinions about comic books, but a lot of people's opinions hardened after those televised hearings. Um, DC did take a hit from the fact that Frederick Wortham had serious and kind of weird and freaky issues with their three superheroes that had their own titles, Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman, um, making some uh, damaging statements about those characters and about superheroes in general. However, the fact is that the general public didn't pay a whole lot of attention to what Wortham was saying about those, uh, those three characters who had become an established part, really, of American pop culture by that time. Uh, most of the attention was on the horror and the sex and its effects on its, you know, alleged effects on young minds. So DC came out all right there too, really. But Jack Leibowitz and Erwin Donenfeld, and, and by the way, I didn't mention Harry Donenfeld, even though, you know, he's co-owner because he's mostly, you know, schmoozing and partying at this point. So uh, Leibowitz and Erwin Donenfeld 
saw an opportunity here, right? Because EC and Timely, who had heavily invested in horror and crime, and a lot of the smaller competitors, they were going to be taking a big hit. People were the, the, the parents of comics buying kids and uh, comics buying adults, I guess, were really negative on, on the, the horror and the violence. And now with the Comics Code Authority, it's going to be extremely limited what can be portrayed. And so those companies are going to lose more readers. Now, everyone's losing readers due to TV, but the readers these uh, other companies are losing are people who are already buying comic books. So maybe they'll just buy different comic books. And the superheroes seemed like a fair uh, investment, uh, a fair game, because they didn't have all the baggage. If you look beyond, you know, again, uh, Wortham's uh, sort of hyper-sexualized uh, perceptions of them, uh, they didn't carry this, the same the same onus as you know the crypt keeper telling tales about people's intestines being boiled in front of them and stuff like that. So, Erwin Donenfeld, and this was no doubt um, in a result of conversations with with Leibowitz, uh, but Donenfeld gave a directive to DC editor Julius Schwartz. And the directive was, get us some more superheroes. Let's get a new one. Let's get a new one, put them out there, and see what happens. Now, remember Julius Schwartz, everything that he does uh, has kind of a science fiction bent to it. So don't lose sight of that. A lot of the superheroes from the 1940s, uh, although some of them, like Superman, had a science fiction origin, most of them had uh, their origin in magic and mystical powers and so forth. Anyway, Schwartz gives the assignment, and as always, is himself actively involved. But he gives the assignment for a new character to debut in their uh, comic book showcase, to be showcased and see what happens, gives that directive to the writer, Robert Conniger, and two artists, Carmine Infantino and Joe Kubert. Uh, Infantino is going to be doing the pencils and Kubert the inks on this particular venture. And so, they set about trying to figure out what kind of superhero they were going to introduce in the year 1956, um, almost a, a decade after superheroes had begun their slide out of popularity. They decided to go with a superhero that DC already had from the Golden Age, kind of, sort of, and that was The Flash. But they were going to completely redo it. They were going to completely redo the character, have uh, a, a new secret identity, a new origin, uh, a new costume, the whole deal. And so, in showcase number four in October 1956, The Flash, Fastest Man Alive, made his debut and although no one had any way of knowing this at the time the silver age of comics had its debut so the golden age of comics started with action comics number one 1938 with the arrival of superman um so far as periodizing, uh, earlier on, I said the Golden Age was from 1938 to the early 50s. That kind of varies by who you ask. I almost think that a better way of periodizing it is that the Golden Age lasted from 1938 until the end of 1949, 
with the cancellation of all the timely slash Marvel superheroes. And within a couple of years, the other ones were gone as well. So there's this period between flashy, successful ages. Um, and I think maybe we could call that the EC age. You know, maybe we could say that that debuted, that started with EC's new trend horror comics in 1950 and lasted until 1956 when EC folded. So we'll call that in between era the EC age. The Silver Age starts in October 1956 and extends, again, this is, it depends on who you ask. The stopping points for these things are usually not as definitive as the starting points, but somewhere around 1970, 70, 71. 70 is probably a good cutoff point. Through 1969, let's say that to make it easier. Anyway, the whole thing starts here with The Flash. Now, um, the, uh, the, the Flash, as envisioned by Conagher, Infantino, and Kubert, and by the way, Infantino designed the new costume to make it look as aerodynamic as possible. So the Flash now is a guy named Barry Allen, not Jay Garrick, who was the original Flash in the Golden Age. Barry Allen, who was a police scientist. And there's a little bit of a meta thing going on here because he's actually, if you'll notice, this is a page from, from the story on the upper left, he's reading an old Flash comic book from the 1940s. And he's like, ha, 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 wonder what it would be like to be the fastest man on Earth. Well, I'll never know. The Flash is just a character some writer dreamed up. And then he goes about uh, working on his experiments when, boom, he's struck by lightning, as one is, uh, right there in front of all these chemicals, and they all react together to make him, uh, to give him the very powers he was just reading about. So he designs himself a different costume. So here are the two flashes on the right jay garrick created in 1940 the original flash from the golden age and barry allen 1956 the silver age flash well the book was a success it was popular it caught on they uh, continued having the flash appear in showcase and with that success, DC decided, kind of like, you know, when they tried out Superman and it worked, to add some more. So DC started retooling more of their old characters that they weren't using anymore from the previous decade. 1959, Gil Kane and the writer John Broom re-envisioned Green Lantern. And just like, uh, just like with the uh, Flash, they gave him a new appearance, a new secret identity, a new origin story, and, and so on. Um, the 1940 original Golden Age, Green Lantern, Alan Scott, had found a weird glowy meteorite that uh, a chunk of it uh, put in his ring and had these weird powers. Hal Jordan test pilot uh, in the Silver Age version was inducted into an intergalactic peacekeeping force called the Green Lantern Corps that is run by these blue aliens called the Guardians of Oa and uh, every sector in space has one Green Lantern assigned to it. So uh, that's 1959 uh, 1961, Gil Kane, uh, along with writer Gardner Fox, retool Hawkman and his girlfriend, Hawk Girl, from the Golden Age. Um, the, uh, the mask on Hawkman is a little bit different, but that had changed actually during the Golden Age. You know, I originally had this big vulture looking beak. Um, the real change, there, there was very little change in appearance. And they kind of, kind of, sort of had the same names, except in the 1940 version, Carter Hall, I think it was an archaeologist, uh, and his girlfriend Shiera Hall, were reincarnated from a couple of ancient Egyptians 
who down through time, this other ancient Egyptian had been trying to break them up, you know, uh, and uh, there were all these magical powers associated uh, with all of this. The 1961 version, instead of Carter Hall and Shiera Hall, it's Qatar Hall and Shiera Hall uh, from another planet, the planet Thanagar. And unlike the Golden Age version, the wings aren't fake. In the Golden Age version, there was a special metal that uh, uh, Carter Hall had that enabled him to defy gravity. But no, these now are a couple of folks from a planet where everybody has wings, and they are actually law enforcement experts from the planet Thanagar who wind up on Earth. The same creative duo, Gardner Fox and Gil Kane, retooled the Atom, one of the original members of the Justice Society, as were the Green Lantern and Hogman. The 1940 Atom, Al Pratt, was just a short guy, uh, a short, tough guy. Um, the new Atom, Ray Palmer, is a scientist who designs this... Uh, this, this invention that enables him to shrink down smaller, teeny tiny, even to the, the subatomic level, which is significantly different from um, the original Atom. And it's actually more like the Golden Age Doll Man, but more so. Some other characters that were around didn't necessarily get major rehauls right off the bat because they didn't need to be reintroduced. Now, Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman obviously didn't need to be reintroduced because they had continually had their own comics, their own titles. In fact, Superman and Batman had uh, at least two apiece and then another one that they were both in together. But, and maybe this is a little misleading when I said there were only three superheroes that made it. Uh, only three superheroes that made it into the 50s and through the 50s with their own title. There were some Golden Age heroes who were still appearing in those titles, right? Superman, Batman, Action, Adventure, Detective. They all had backup stories. And a couple of the Golden Age characters, Green Arrow and Aquaman, had continued to appear in the backup stories. Uh, I think that Green Arrow was appearing in uh, backup stories for Superboy for a while. Um, Aquaman was uh, in backup stories in Adventure and so forth. So as they're reintroducing these once familiar names in whole new guises, well, all they had to do was trot out uh, Green Arrow and Aquaman as is. So their uh, secret identities didn't change. Green Arrow is still Oliver Queen, and he still looks the same, and he still has the same outfit, and he still has the same origin, actually, as the Silver Age begins in the late 50s. Now, 1968, he did get a remodel um, in his appearance, in his costume, when, um, when he was being written by Denny O'Neill and drawn by Neil Adams, the same guy that kind of subtly changed Batman's appearance. Uh, so he gave Green Arrow, I think, a much cooler look. Uh, and that was the Green Arrow look for two decades. And then in 1986, he got another retooling in, in which he uh, uh, abandoned the old Robin Hood hat and started wearing a hood was the main difference. And that's kind of been, that's kind of been the standard ever since. So that's Green Arrow. Aquaman... Um, didn't really change in appearance when the Silver Age started. He didn't change in his secret identity of Arthur Curry. His powers didn't change, but his origin did get changed. In 1959, there was a story uh, in a backup story in an issue of Adventure. I think it was 260. Uh, how Aquaman came to be. Now, the old story was that uh, Arthur Curry was a, a diver who discovered the ruins of ancient Atlantis and discovered these various uh, 
uh, devices as well as through practice and good American living, learned how to talk to fish and breathe underwater. Uh, the, uh, the revised story was that Arthur Curry was actually the offspring of a human man and an Atlantean woman. So he's half Atlantean and that's why he can breathe in the water and all those other things. So his appearance stayed the same pretty well for, for decades until the 1990s when he lost his hand and uh, got a harpoon for a hand and uh, grew his hair out and grew a beard and got this new new outfit. Some people resisted that look because it wasn't classic traditional Aquaman. I preferred it at the time and to be honest I still do but it only lasted uh, well maybe 10-15 years and then they brought back the original look in the 20 teens. Now if you have seen Aquaman at the movies in the uh, Justice League movie or the Aquaman movie, then you'll know that uh, the Jason Momoa Aquaman owes much more to the 1990s version than to the classic 1940s and 50s and 60s, such as appeared on the Super Friends cartoons. Right? He's got the long hair and the beard. His, uh, his outfit looks closer to that of 1990s Aquaman. Except that in the Aquaman movie, he also gets this other outfit, right? That is the traditional Aquaman look. So it's kind of a merging of the two. Finally, one other character that didn't have to be updated for the Silver Age was the Martian Manhunter. And that's because he had only been around for about a year when the Silver Age started. He had started uh, as a backup feature, I think, in Detective Comics. He was a dude from Mars, uh, and apparently dudes from Mars are shapeshifters. And he was the last member of his race, and he was stranded on Earth. And he, his name, his Martian name, is John Jones. Uh, and so that translates into English as John Jones. And so he has this human disguise and this uh, cover identity, I think, as a private detective. Um, so he gets... Uh, a more prominent, slightly more prominent place as he starts to interact with some of the other heroes as the Silver Age gets underway. In early 1960, the Irwin Donenfeld to Julius Schwartz line was open again, uh, this time with the directive, hey, Remember that Justice Society of America thing that we used to do uh, 20 years ago? Um, why don't we do something like that with our new characters? And so Schwartz assigned this to Gardner Fox. Again, with Schwartz working very closely because he always did on the things he edited. So with, uh, with artist Mike Sikowski providing pencils in the... Uh, the 28th issue of The Brave and the Bold, the Justice League of America, was introduced with its uh, seven founding members, Superman and Batman, who don't appear on the cover. I guess they assumed these guys get enough exposure. Didn't occur to them that that could have given the book more exposure, I guess. Superman and Batman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, The Flash, Aquaman, and the Martian Manhunter. Um, this, uh, this book was a, a huge success, and shortly thereafter, the Justice League of America got its own title, uh, also by Fox and Sikowski. Sikowski would do the art for much of the 1960s, and it was Sikowski, by the way, who took over after Ross, uh, uh, Ross Andrew left, uh, and Esposito left uh, Wonder Woman. So, anyway, these are the originals. Shortly afterward, um, just a few issues in, there are some new recruits. Green Arrow, who had kind of gotten lost in the wayside here, and the Adam and Hawkman, who probably weren't original recruits, 
because uh, they had not been retooled yet. They got retooled in 1961. This was 1960. The Justice League first appeared. So Gardner Fox, bear that in mind. The same guy, who the same writer, who essentially co-created the Justice Society of America, 19 years later also co-created the Justice League of America. Well, uh, those are the original members back then. Here is a painting by Alex Ross done more recently that sort of reimagines in Alex Ross's very realistic painting style the seven original members of the Justice League of America. Now, this is all well and good. Uh, this is selling a lot of books, actually. Um, but there's a potential problem. Uh, the problem is that, you know, it's okay that the Flash and uh, Green Lantern and even, even Hawkman are not the same people that those heroes were circa 1942. But uh, what about the fact Batman and Superman are? And so they're in stories in World War II, then they're in stories again in the 1960s, and they don't seem to have aged. Uh, how's that going to be resolved? Does it even need to be resolved? Is anyone even going to notice? Well, um, things are going to happen that uh, cause such a resolution to become necessary. 